hit here. Uh, go ahead. Uh, okay, so let me let me uh, ask a, a question here, um, and and uh, that is, what is a low and slow attack? Does anybody know what a low and slow attack means? Who wants to take that one? Low and slow attack. Low profile, long time. Yeah, that's 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 the basic idea. Is instead of an attacker coming in all at once and going bam, 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 attack the system, they'll come in, do a little bit, then sit back. Come back maybe a minute later, maybe an hour later, maybe a week later, maybe a month later, and do some more. And then sit back and wait. And so on. This sort of attack has existed for a long time. What does this have to do with AI? Well, AI systems have a window that they're looking at when you when you ask them what's going on and whether we're asking them about uh, language or we're asking them about attacks, they have a window they're looking at. And if that attack happened a little bit last month and a little bit the month before, can they put the pieces together and that's a lot harder than it sounds. Um, so I, I, this is one of the limits. I'm not saying that AI systems aren't valuable. I'm just saying these are these are limits that we need to consider is that low and slow attacks are more likely to be missed. Um, also, LLMs have a memory. I don't mean a memory, of course, in the same way you or I do, but uh, uh, still um, uh, you can put things, you can overload uh, an LLM by continuing to give it more information, more information, more information. So an attacker might come in, do a small piece of the attack, and then do a bunch of really innocuous or ordinary things, uh, which fills up the LLM's memory because they, they usually have some sort of a limited size that, that they keep around. And then you do, then the attacker does the next part. So we, we have to be aware that if we're not careful, these sorts of attacks can be completely um, uh, missed by attacks. And, and another piece of it is um, with a regular, with a traditional intrusion detection system or malware detection system or things like that, <clears throat> it's relatively easy to measure whether it's doing a good job or not. And the way we measure whether it's doing a good job is we run a, um, a data set. We have a, a, a just like in, in chemistry, you might have a data set of, uh, of, of chemicals that you're trying to detect and you could run them over and over again and figure out which things it actually detects and how accurately it detects it. We can do the same thing with traditional computing architectures. But when you have an AI system, it's much harder to measure that um, because you can't examine the code in any meaningful way to figure out, is it actually detecting the same things over and over? So these are some of the challenges. Let me move on to a different area where we can use AI. And I'm gonna start by focusing on, on positives. Um, and I think somebody mentioned this, but I'm not sure. Um, has, have any of you ever tried reading source code? I don't care what programming language you're talking about, but reading source code to find vulnerabilities. Have any of you ever tried that? It's a really, really yeah, good booty. It's a really hard thing to do. Um, it it takes a lot of time, a lot of expertise, and the particularly difficult thing about finding vulnerabilities by reading source code, it doesn't matter if it's open source or not. If no, if you can't actually read it, then the fact that it's open source, it doesn't make a difference. The problem is when you have a, a page of code or a few pages of code, the, the sort of thing that you might turn in as a homework assignment, it's possible to read it and understand the whole thing. When you have millions of lines or uh, of, of software, it's impossible to keep that all in your brain at one time. This is one of the areas where 
AI systems have an advantage because they can keep a lot more than we can. And they can reason about much more than we can. So using AI systems to find vulnerabilities in software is a new area and an exciting area. Uh, they can both, if, if we can give them a set of code and say, here's something where there's a vulnerability here, and they can look for similar vulnerabilities elsewhere, but they can also piece together things in ways that people can't and find new vulnerabilities. So this is a, an up and coming area that's, that's really important and useful. Um, so we might even be able to use some of these AI systems to, to reason in interesting ways. For example, if we give it a training set with vulnerabilities in Java programs, and then we give it Python programs, can we can we get it to find the vulnerabilities in the Python programs, even though it hasn't seen vulnerabilities in Python before? So that, that might be an interesting area to think about uh, wh whether you could uh, do something like that. The problem though is what we really want is novel vulnerabilities. And th those are the zero days that, that get the big money. And it's really hard to, to get an AI system to find things like that because the novelty, it's not impossible, but uh, this is an area of active research. This isn't something we're seeing today. There's also the, the other angle of it, which is <clears throat> if I plug my system, if I, if I give my source code to an analysis tool and I say, hey, did you find any vulnerabilities? And the, the, the AI system says, nope, couldn't find anything. Does that mean that that software doesn't have vulnerabilities? No, it doesn't mean it doesn't have vulnerabilities. It means the AI system didn't find any vulnerabilities. So you have to make sure that we're using these systems appropriately and not giving them credit for things that they can't actually do, like detect all vulnerabilities. There's an expression, looking for your keys under the lamppost. Has anybody there heard that expression other than Lyle? I know Lyle has heard that expression. It's very common in the US. I'm always losing my keys, so. Yeah. <laughs> Any of the rest of you know what the, it means to say looking for your keys under the lamppost? No? It means that you 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 were out in the visiting with friends, and later that night you discover you can't find your keys. So you were at a party, you were at this, you were at that. Where do you look for your keys? Well, you look for your keys where the light is good under the lamppost. But is that where you dropped your keys? <laughs> no. I mean, it might be, but it might have been anywhere else. Um, but we have a tendency in computing and in many other fields also to look for our keys under the lamppost, to look where the light is brightest instead of where the risk is highest. And this is one of the problems with using a lot of these automated systems is they the, that they tell us about the things they know about, the easy parts. They don't tell us about all the other parts. Okay, so let me move on to another uh, use for AI uh, in cybersecurity. Um, when Lyle asked about how many of you had written code, only a few of you raised your hand as far as I could see. Um, have any of you used um, GitHub to try to create code? I, 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 I see I see Booty has. Anybody has anybody else uh, done? Uh, yeah, a few a few people. It's using GitHub um, gives you a lot of resources. And there are a lot of uh, tools out there nowadays. One of the cool new things that's available is something called Copilot. Have any of you used Copilot? I haven't. I, I used to be a programmer when I was young. It's been many, many years since I've written code. But Copilot is this really cool uh, capability that um, when you as, you, as you write code, it helps you. It, it fills in the pieces for you. It makes it more efficient so you don't have to go look at the manuals for things because it's used AI to mine 
lots of open source software and figure out if you start doing this, then this is probably the next thing you want to do and so on. And it can automate creating code for you, um, which is a good thing uh, because it's it's time consuming, uh, sometimes boring to write code, although I used to really enjoy it when I was young. Um, uh, but are there are there risks associated with having the AI system write the code for you? So let me let me pause here and let me ask the room. What are some of the risks you might have of having an AI system write the code for you? While you guys are thinking about your responses, uh, I know that I, for one, am looking forward to Copilot with uh, Microsoft. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but uh, you're going to be able to type in and tell Microsoft, create a PowerPoint deck for me about any topic, you pick a topic about uh, sports cars or about, uh, um, you know, uh, electrical engineering for um, uh, some application, um, an aerospace application. And then it will create a deck for you based on sort of what it thinks are the best topics. So when we started this presentation, Jeremy had a few slides up it was more of a outline of what the slide should talk about. The, the AI with Copilot would actually create the entire deck with the beautiful images and all the text. Um, so in my day, we had to do that with blood, sweat, and tears and getting boxes the right size. <laughs> Nowadays, it's just like that. But let me, let me build on your example, Lyle, because that's a great example. Let's say we have that magical system, and it's not magical. It's, it, of course, exists at some level today, and it's improving every day. But let's assume, and let's assume we're, we ask it, create me a slide deck about the best uh, cars there are. Um, and um, that's great. Um, maybe you have a favorite car, um, but the way that AI system isn't smart. AI systems aren't smart about anything. They, they've just been trained with lots of data. If that AI system was trained with a data set that was mostly, say, uh, 1950s East European cars, it might come up with a uh, slide deck that might feature uh, 1950s East European cars, which are really horrible if you've ever seen any of them. Lada, L-A-D-A, was, was a common brand. They, they were terrible. Um, and so the input gener cause output. So it's really important that we understand what the input is. There's, there's an expression, garbage in, garbage out, that, that many of you are probably familiar with. If we train the, the AI system on garbage, whether the garbage is pictures of cars or whether the picture is, uh, or whether the input is, is uh, uh, software, if we haven't vetted the input before we use it to train the AI system, then what we're gonna get on the output is gonna be garbage. So let me let me ask again, uh, um, what, what are some of the, what, what are your thoughts about using, uh, about having a system like GitHub that generates code for you? Okay, the gentleman over here. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, the problem is when you are writing code uh, by using GitHub or like ChatGPT is that the companies that use them like GitHub and, and ChatGPT has access to your code. Mm -hmm. And that's why if say ChatGPT wants to, uh, I don't know, OpenAI wants to, for some reason, publish those codes out, out in the internet, you are out of luck that you say that yeah that, that's a great point yeah i i hadn't thought about that one but you're right other other thoughts about using ai to generate code for you professor yeah. i think that the uh 
Oh, ho please hold the microphone closer. Yes. Oh, okay. Now, okay. I, I'm afraid that the AI or the generator creates code that I don't understand, and it's actually a backdoor, backdoor yeah. that somebody can enter later on. That, that's that's a, my worries. That's a great point because if the, if the training data had code that had backdoors in it, just exactly as you say, um, then it's not that the AI system is trying to be malicious. It, it doesn't know because it has no brain. It has an analysis. And so it may generate code that has backdoors in it. And if it's too complex, as you say, we as humans may not be able to look at it and conclude, oh, maybe we shouldn't use that code. Any other uh, suggestions of what some of the pros and cons are of using an AI system to create code for us? One more in the back. Well, I think the AI code generation is not uh, designed for security uh, uh, purpose. Sorry. I mean, uh, there's some example that uh, the code generated by AI have some security vulner vulnerabilities. So I think it is still, we have, uh, the human has still have to uh, analyze the code first and uh, maybe because I think it's uh, the AI is not designed for the security, mm -hmm. the, the code generation is not, uh, uh, the, uh, designed for the security firm. Okay. I think that's it, my point. Yeah, great. Um, let me throw one more in, which is that if the AI system is trained on proprietary code, for example, maybe it's code that is used by uh, the military for weapons, or maybe it's code that belongs to a healthcare company for their system or a banking system, um, the AI system might accidentally leak that code out to uh, other, uh, as part of generating code, because it doesn't invent anything new. It just replays things it has in novel ways. So there's, there's certainly risks like that. Let me move on. Uh, by the way, how much time do I have? I'm, I mean, I'm having fun here, but I don't know how much time I have. We have, a, uh, we have a class and in 9.40, uh, but it's up to you. Okay. 9.40 or 9.30. Okay. 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 So that's about 50 minutes? Is that okay. Correct? Okay, good. 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 We still have more time, like uh, 40 more minutes. Okay. 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 So you, you have plenty of time. Uh, you can have like okay. 30 more minutes. 30 more minutes. Okay. okay. As long as nobody is falling asleep, I, I think that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Um, let me, so a couple of you mentioned in the introductory predicting breaches, detecting, uh, or, or maybe not, I mean, the whole issue of using AI for, um, detecting attacks. Um, I don't think anybody mentioned it, but but a common use for uh, AI systems now is in spam uh, filtering and detecting uh, phishing attacks. Um, phishing attacks are really, really hard to figure out because, uh, I mean, all attacks are, but phishing in particular are, um, because there's not only the technical element, there's also the human element uh, that um, uh, uh, we all want to believe the things we see. That's just a human nature. And so attackers are getting better at creating messages that look more and more, they don't have to look perfect, uh, but uh, attackers are getting better at, at generating messages. So let me let me move on. So we've been talking now about so far about securing AI systems, or excuse me, about using AI systems for security. We've, we've talked about both pros and cons with detecting attacks, um, finding malware, 
uh, writing secure code, um, uh, finding vulnerabilities. Um, but actually, there was one other thing I wanted to to no no okay. Now I want to talk about securing the AIs themselves against attacks. So I'm going to change topics entirely. So AI systems, just like any other system, whether it's a, 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 a an operating system or a banking system or a website, we have to attack, protect the AI systems against attacks because they receive inputs just like any other system, <clears throat> but they can be attacked just like any other system. The challenge is we have to protect not only the software, but also the training sets, the data, the models, all that stuff. Because if we don't protect all of it, then uh, even if the, the, the software isn't compromised, um, uh, compromising data sets might be good enough. And this is especially true because a lot of AI systems learn from their input, not only during a training phase, but operationally, they get there's the idea is they get better and better as they see more and more data. But if an attacker can send, can give them input, then the attacker can teach it to to operate incorrectly over time. They may not be able to do it initially, but they may be able to cause it over time to uh, learn to do things incorrectly. So one of the challenges is how we ensure that the training data and the continuous data that we improve used to improve it is uh, trustworthy, um, especially if we're using this uh, system for uh, monitoring. Um, what if, for example, let's imagine uh, an AI system that's used for self-driving cars. Um, that's not too hard to imagine. Um, I, I would imagine uh, most of us read uh, in the media about Tesla and uh, other self-driving cars, even uh, if if we've never driven one ourselves. Uh, I've never driven a, a Tesla. Um, they're pretty cool from I've been I've been a passenger, but I've never driven one. And, and they are pretty cool, but they're also really scary. Um, because they are based on all sorts of AI technology for detecting other cars for detecting traffic lights, for detecting uh, pedestrians, et cetera. We, and we've all read about uh, crashes that have happened. Or, and we've also read about um, attacks, um, or not attacks, but we've read about cases where uh, autonomous vehicles uh, just stop because they can't figure out what to do next. So, um, have any of you heard uh, of the stop sign attack? Let me see if I can find a picture of it. Um, let's see. Here we go. Uh, give me one second. Have any of you seen this this picture before? Yeah, w what am I showing? What is relevant about this stop sign? Does it look like a stop sign to you? I guess that's one of the adversarial patch. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. This is, someone has modified a stop sign so it looks like a stop sign to you and me, but as an uh, but an, it's an adversarial input, and so um, it doesn't look like a stop sign to the uh, to the AI system. And clearly, this is an example with a stop sign. People have done other things like that. If you Google, uh, Budi, I can't hear you. Uh, what is an adversarial attack? Because only one person uh, knows about this in the whole class. <laughs> ah, um, actually, the student who who mentioned it, maybe that student would be willing to <laughs> ah, to give okay. a description. So, so yeah, pa, what is an adversarial attack? <laughs> uh, not to put you on the on the spot too okay. much. <laughs> 
uh, all I can say is that a special patch is one kind of input uh, that is uh, intentionally uh, being modified uh, in the certain area of the input. That's uh, the AI system will be uh, misdirected to that point instead of the whole big picture. So uh, the uh, AI system will be, will, will be misled to uh, another uh, conclusion or classification uh, instead of giving the correct result. Uh, just uh, an example, uh, if uh, we put a sticker on the traffic sign, so uh, we as human beings uh, normally uh, see the traffic sign instead of the sticker, but the AI system uh, will, be direct, uh, will be directed uh, only to focus more on the sticker uh, so that uh, the whole point of the traffic sign will be uh, ignored. Uh, that's uh, very dangerous for the autonomous vehicle. Uh, if uh, the traffic sign uh, could not be read as uh, correctly as it, it is in, intended. Thank you. Terrific answer. Th thank you. Let me show you a, 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 another one. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Share screen. This is one uh, people um, putting stickers on their faces in particular places or putting glasses can convince AI systems that the picture of you isn't really a picture of you. It's a picture of somebody else, or maybe it's not a picture of anybody at all. So why, why is that a problem? You're doing facial recognition and you can convince it that you're somebody else. Can you get into their account? What if your, what if your iPhone do any of you have iPhones? I, uh, <laughs> I'm sure most of you have iPhones. I'm joking. Um, uh, I don't. No, actually, I do. I do now have an iPhone. I have an iPhone. No, these are technical people. They're probably Android people. Let's yeah, see. I have one Raise of your each. hand if you're an Android user. Okay. I have one of each. My personal, <laughs> my personal phone is an Android phone, and my work phone, when I work with Lyle, is is an iPhone, <laughs> because that's what that's what the embassy gives us. Non technical um, people. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, um, um, for those of you, actually, both, I guess, Androids have this also now. Um, uh, there's you have facial recognition software, but if I can put on a funny pair of glasses and or, or or put some stickers on my face or some labels or whatever and convince uh, Lyle's phone that I'm Lyle how is how is Lyle going to feel about that I think I need a new phone now <laughs> <laughs> so th these are some of the problems with AI is it can solve some great problems. We, we, the reason we have facial recognition and the reason it works pretty damn well is because of AI, but also because of, uh, and, but we also need to recognize its limitations. We should also recognize um, other aspects. I mean, what I, the example I just gave of me being able to unlock Lyle's phone, I mean, that's kind of a fun example, but what if, there's a uh, facial recognition system that is used um, by uh, government to look for um, uh, criminals who are breaking into stores or whatever. And they wear uh, some of these fake things that, that make the facial recognition system think it's somebody else. So now they're not trying to convince the facial recognition system that there's uh, to let them in. They're trying to make get somebody else in trouble. So we, we need to be very aware that all of these systems can be used in many different ways. And sometimes it's not uh, clear that whether they're good or bad. Um, I'm not saying they aren't there aren't uses for them, but we need to be uh, aware of uh, the the pros and cons. Um, let me um, let me let me give a, a move to another uh, example. We we've talked a couple times through here about intrusion detection systems. Um, can we use? You know, I'm going to skip that one. 
Let me um, go back to the discussion of um, uh, uh, using LLMs in uh, software development. Um, so we can use LLMs to find vulnerabilities in software. Can we use LLMs to also find, find those vulnerabilities and then create attacks? And in particular, can we use them to create attacks that won't be findable by other LLMs? So we have LLM against LLM trying to outcompete each other. One LLM is trying to find the attack. Another LLM is trying to create the attack. There, there have been some research projects that have tried doing this. And, and I'm not going to tell you I have the answer because I don't have the answer. I'm suggesting this is an area of ongoing research. Um, and, and, and there isn't, we aren't going to come to a conclusion, because as the LLMs get better, we are going to have new ways to create defenses to find vulnerabilities, and we're going to have new ways to create attacks. So we have to be aware that both of those are going to happen simultaneously. One of the things that, that people are really concerned about is um, using LLMs to find flaws in cryptographic algorithms. Now here I'm not talking about the cryptographic software because yes, finding vulnerabilities in cryptographic software is important, but what if we can find LLMs in cryptographic algorithms? Have, have you discussed in any of your classes um, how cryptographic algorithms are developed, things like uh, AES and RSA, uh, uh, what, what the science is behind them. Have you talked about that a little bit? Raise your hand if you've done anything like that. Okay. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Let's see a the bit. professor and, uh, and a couple of students. One of our doctoral candidates. And okay. okay. You, you have as well. Uh, Good. You got about four people. Good. Okay. So, when we use any modern technology, we're relying on encryption. Um, it, it's just a fact of, of life. The way cryptographic algorithms get developed is you get really, really, really good mathematicians. And they, learn, they, they study the fundamentals of the mathematics. And then they put these, these mathematical methods together in novel ways that, um, and they study uh, and they prove things about those algorithms. The problem is sometimes they make mistakes because they make assumptions. So right now there's an ongoing effort in the United States. Well, it's being led in the United States, but it's being participated in worldwide uh, to develop what are called post-quantum cryptographic algorithms. So I'm sure most of you have heard about crypto, excuse me, quantum computers and how quantum computers have the ability to decrypt things that have been encrypted using traditional computers uh, and traditional algorithms. So the idea of post-quantum algorithms is to develop methods that can't be decrypted uh, even by quantum computers. Um, and it's really hard to do. And so there's been a competition that's been ongoing for close to 10 years where a lot of really smart people, not including me because I'm not a cryptographer, um, have put together really good algorithms and then people have studied them. And there have been worldwide competitions to try to find are these algorithms good enough? And so they took, I don't remember, several dozen potentials and they narrowed them down and narrowed them down and narrowed them down. And they got to four finalists uh, about a year ago and they announced these were the four finalists and nobody had been able to find a way to break any of these cryptographic algorithms. And then I think it was about three weeks later, somebody found a fundamental problem in the algorithm for one of them. And suddenly it went from one of the four best algorithms in the world to, oh, well, 
that was a fun idea. Um, and it happened just amazingly fast because somebody thought of a new idea. So what does this have to do with AI? Well, the, the way these cryptographic algorithms typically get broken is that someone comes up with a completely different way of putting together ideas and information that has never been done before. And that's what happened. I mean, I don't, I don't understand either the post-quantum cryptographic algorithm or how it was broken, but I do understand that th th this was the net effect. And so years and years of work was thrown out. And so this is one of the interesting ideas is can AI systems be used to break cryptographic algorithms? There's a lot of fear about this. There isn't a lot of confidence about it yet. Um, it's a research area. Uh, but if you're interested in cryptography and post-quantum cryptography and AI, this is a really interesting area to be working in is can AI systems find vulnerabilities in cryptographic algorithms? We know already that they can develop proofs. There have been mathematical theorems proven that had been unproven for centuries. Um, and AI systems have been able to prove things that nobody had been able to prove because they could gather much more data than a human could, uh, much more information and put it together in, in novel ways. So this is an interesting question. I, I, I'm not worried too much about it, but I'm worried about it a little bit. And so when I say I'm worried, what I mean is um, I've described myself for decades as professionally paranoid. I'm scared of everything because my job tells me I should be scared of everything. Personally, I try not to be scared of everything, but professionally, I'm scared of everything. Okay, um, let me talk a little bit about bias because we can't talk about AI systems without talking about bias. Have any of you heard of the Amazon um, uh, AI resume uh, scandal from a number of years ago. Any of you heard about this one? No, I don't see any hands in the room. So let me, let me briefly explain what it is. The idea of AI systems, as, as we've been talking about for the past hour or so, is that we can give them data and it can build patterns of the data. And then we can give it some other thing, data and say, find things that match that pattern, whether those things are attacks in software or whether those are uh, network attacks or uh, whether they're uh, so, uh, lyrics for a song, we can, we can get them to do it. And then with generative AI, we can um, get the system to create new ones like this. Um, so what Amazon wanted to do is they were having trouble. So many people were applying for jobs. Oh, crap. Okay, um, head, heads up. Um, I just got a warning. My computer is going to thinks it's going to reboot itself in five minutes. It doesn't always, but if I disappear in five minutes, that's what's happening, and I'll be back as soon as it reboots. But I, that's a warning that if it happens, you'll know why. Um, and there's no wait later, I'm in the middle of something. It thinks it's uh, late at night in, in uh, the United States. So it thinks this is a convenient time to do it without asking it. Okay, let me keep talking. And if I get cut off, you'll know why. And I'll be back in five minutes or so. Okay, um, so what they did is they gave resumes. They gave the, the Amazon took the resumes of all the people they had hired and all the people they had uh, who had applied but hadn't been hired. And they said, here's examples of what we want and here's examples of what we don't want. Build a, a large language model. And then they started feeding resumes to it. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick on uh, Budi and myself. Um, as and let's imagine we're two people who were hired by Amazon and, and, and Lyle also. Um, and uh, then I'm going to pick um, uh, Dion as an example of someone who didn't get hired by Amazon, just totally imaginary here. And it built a model. 
it, it took it took let's say it was using photographs instead of resumes what what was the what was the model that it built that caused it to hire Lyle and Buji and me and not Dion well similar to the makeup of this room <laughs> similar to the makeup <laughs> Lyle and Buji and I all have facial hair uh, so it, it wasn't it wasn't looking we didn't tell it look for people with facial hair we told it to look for people with who look like the people we've hired and so it did and that's exactly what happened with amazon is it, they looked at all the they put in all the resumes of all the people that they had hired and said find more like this and so it did and amazon had hired a lot of men and very few women and it had hired mostly people who look like me and not so much people who look like Lyle, by which I mean it hired people with light skin and not so much people with dark skin. And so the computer system said, you should hire more. It didn't say it this way, but it effectively it said, you should hire more white men. Was that what Amazon was trying to do? No, at least I can't imagine it was what they were trying to do, but it was what their system did because they trained because of the data they used to train their system. And this can be true in security as well. We have to make sure that when we, we give it training data, the training data represents what we want it to represent because it's a lot, it's very easy to, to get it wrong. There was there was a, another case that was pretty famous where um, it was given a, an AI system was trained with data to try to distinguish uh, dogs and wolves. Um, and after much back and forth, I'll just tell you the answer is that it, it, it had concluded that if there was snow in the background, it was a wolf. And if there was not snow in the background, it was a dog. It didn't actually understand how, what the difference was between a dog and a wolf. It just n knew that if there was snow, that, that, that it was a wolf. So this Meaning is- that Most of the images might've had snow with a wolf in it versus a wolf without snow. Right, versus a dog, yeah. And, and so it, it, its rate of false positives and false negatives was wrong. And so this is, again, something we need to be very aware of in terms of bias, in terms of use in security, in, in terms of all sorts of different things like that. Let me is, just, add, if, let me just add one please. point. So going back to Jeremy's example of Amazon, uh, I'm guessing one of the reasons, uh, and this is based on studies that have shown, one of the reasons that they ended up generating a model, which predominantly resulted in hiring um, Caucasian white men or uh, whatever the trend was. It's also probably because the programmers of the models were themselves of the same demographic. And so you often model what you know best. And uh, that gets to the point of why it's important to have um, diversity in the people designing the models themselves. So I see a fairly diverse group here. Uh, we have a couple of women in the room. We probably need uh, quite a few more. Uh, I think a uh, professor said there's about 50-50 nowadays. At yeah, yeah. No, undergraduate, okay, okay. So we still uh, have a couple of years yeah. to go. But um, uh, the more diversity you have, the the more complete the model can become. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Uh, that's I'm glad, glad you said that, Lyle. Um, we've seen this a lot in facial recognition software that um, it, it's getting better, but it's nowhere near where it should be, that facial recognition software is much better at recognizing light-skinned people than dark-skinned people, and much better at recognizing men than women. This is, uh, this is not opinion, this is, this is fact, uh, um, and it's a, a question of what we do to solve the problem. Um, and so uh, it, it is something as whenever we design systems, we need to be very aware of this sort of thing. Um, so are these things 
the the facial recognition issue, the Amazon resume issue, uh, the dogs and wolves. Are these security questions or are they just just usability questions? And I'm going to argue that they are security questions because in order we, we want our systems to be secure and trustworthy, we need to be able to trust our systems and we can't trust them if they give us false answers whether that falseness is because of a security problem or because of a bias problem. So I'm going to argue that these are in fact cybersecurity problems. When I started um, working uh, in my current job at, at the National Science Foundation, I used to say, if I go on a job uh, on a dating site and I say, I'm 1.9 meters tall. That's clearly a lie. You, well, you can't tell that, but Lyle knows that because he's met me in person. Um, I'm 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 shorter than Lyle is, um, uh, and and heavier also. <laughs> um, uh, but um, but maybe more handsome. Uh, no, I was gonna uh, about to say exactly the opposite. I would say on a dating site, if I said I'm 1.9 meters tall and I'm handsome, that would all be a lie, but would it be cybersecurity? That was that was the line I would always use. And and um, the answer is uh, uh, it's clearly a, a lie, but is it is it cybersecurity? And I argue the answer is yes. And on my program, we think about. Um, Cybersecurity is also including things like cyber stalking and cyber bullying of children and things like that. We think that that is part of cybersecurity because we need to have uh, online systems that we can all rely on and trust. So let me let me just touch on. I'm sorry. Your question, Jeremy. Yeah, please. Would you also consider fake news uh, hoax as a cybersecurity issues also? If Absolutely. I'm glad you said and that. Why? And why? Uh, it, it comes down to this, the same problem. We need to be able to rely on our computer systems uh, to trust our computer systems. Um, it, it, it is a fuzzy issue, though, because... Um, uh, deep fakes, fake uh, misinformation, disinformation, all these things exist at the intersection of computing and social sciences. And so the program that I run in the US includes social scientists and computer scientists and mathematicians and engineers and educators. And all of us work together because we view it as an interdisciplinary problem. We don't view cybersecurity as just a technical problem. We call it a socio-technical problem. I didn't make that word up. But the, if you uh, if you Google socio-technical, uh, that's what we view this as the intersection of social, societal, and technical issues together. You can't solve um, problems like misinformation and disinformation from a purely technical perspective, but you can't solve them without a technical perspective. You need, you need to have both. Um, and, and again, AI comes into both of those. We can use AI to detect um, uh, some types of phishing attacks, uh, misinformation attacks, uh, bullying attacks, all those sorts of things. But, we, but AI can also be used to create those. And we've seen this in particular in the United States in elections where we've seen um, use of AI to create new attacks uh, uh, against elections uh, by, by spreading false information. One more uh, question here, Jeremy. Please, please. Yes, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, I was having a bit of a concern when you talk about uh, biases and uh, the problem of mis misinformation and disinformation uh, about using AI to help with that about social science uh, no, no, uh, social issues with cybersecurity. Uh, the problem that I was having with is how do you differentiate uh, reality from 
biases, particularly your own biases. <laughs> Uh, the the one who makes the models or the institution that makes the models that deploys the models the biases how do you differentiate reality from your own biases if even you know it's your own biases that's a terrific question um and the answer is you can't <laughs> um your reality and my reality are going to be different your biases and my biases are going to be different we it's it's not that we can prevent the biases uh because we don't as you say we don't even agree what those biases are necessarily but we need to be aware of them we can't pretend that they don't exist and this is part of what the problem was with amazon is they said oh there's no problem that was their initial reaction there's no problem and with the facial recognition systems the initial comment was oh there's no problem it's not that there's no problem. There is a problem. What we choose to do about it is the question. And that's where we as computer scientists um, or, or information technologists or other uh, technical people need to play a very important role in working uh, with our peers in the social sciences and also working with our peers in policymaking uh, because policymakers, whether... Uh, in the United States or in Indonesia or in any other country, most of the policymakers are not technical experts the way you are. Um, uh, they need your your advice uh, on how to set policies. And this is actually leading into the last topic I, I wanted to address um, today, uh, which is um, a... a a homework assignment. My professor, am I allowed to give a homework assignment? Sure. Okay. Um, are any of you <laughs> are any of you members of the Association for Computing Machinery (ACM)? No. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Yeah. Uh, most of us are uh, IEEE uh, members. Instead okay. Of ACM. The, that, that's good too. That's good too. IEEE is almost as good as ACM. I say that. <laughs> um, I, I was a member of both ACM and IEEE for about 40 years. And about five years ago, I dropped out of IEEE. But if you're familiar with it, the, 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 this is an area though where the two are different. Um, ACM has a public policy committee, um, which I led for a number of years until just a few months ago. Um, and the ACM public policy committee um, develops statements about um, what policy issues are around technology. And there are two recent uh, ACM uh, policy uh, issue, uh, statements that I, I, I will... Let's see, do I have this on this computer? I'll, I'll mm, give me one second if I have. Well, Jeremy these. looks for that. Uh, just going back to your point, I, I think nobody can be perfect or know everything, right? So we had a former defense leader, um, love him or hate him, Donald Rumsfeld. He used to say, you know, they're the unknowns and there are the unknown unknowns. Um, and so, um, Sometimes, no matter how smart you are, there are going to be things that you just will not be able to grasp. Either you don't have the time, resources, or ability. That's why it's important to have uh, a team of people that you work with, and preferably a team of people with different expertise, and different backgrounds, different ways of looking at an issue. Um, that's another reason why we're here today is because we want to bring all of you into the fold uh, because you're bringing things that no one else has thought of before. Uh, and so it's important it's important to have your views, your expertise um, as part of the future of whether it's AI, whether it's um, cybersecurity or whether it's some other um, problem set engineering or whatever it is. Um, and so um, uh, you know the the future uh, belongs to you guys. You guys are well positioned here at an elite university in Indonesia, which is a thriving and developing country. Um, and so um, whatever we can do to partner with you and um, 
and uh, realize that dream, um, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we're here to support you and um, we want to see you succeed. Uh, back to you, Jeremy. Thank you. So let me point to two, can I just pull this up twice? No, okay. Let me point to two recent statements from ACM and these are not US government. I, I, I need to emphasize these are um, the professional society ACM. Um, it's it's the part of the society that is focused on U.S. issues, but these actually were uh, also uh, um, developed by European um, scientists, not just American scientists. So the first one is called uh, Principles for the Development, Deployment, and Use of Generative AI Technologies. And I am going to put the link for that one in the chat. And the second one is called a uh, statement on principles for responsible algorithmic systems. And I'm gonna put that one in the chat. Yeah, okay. I wanted to make sure I got both of them. And so your homework assignment is to read these two. They're, they're short, they're like, five pages each um, and think about them and consider what are the policy issues around AI that, that you're interested in and are there any specific policy issues around AI with respect to Indonesia? What the, there are pending laws on privacy protections in Indonesia. Um, I, I'm sorry, the, the law has been passed. The regulations are in the process of being discussed. Um, I'll be in Jogjakarta on November 1st and 2nd uh, for a workshop there on that topic. Um, but I encourage you to read these two, read the um, uh Reg proposed regulations from the Indonesian government and think about, and I don't have the answer. I mean, I don't really know what the right answer is, but um, I encourage you to think about uh, how uh, Indonesia needs to respond uh, to artificial intelligence to make sure that AI is working for Indonesia and Indonesians and, and uh, uh, not putting people at risk. So let me conclude my comments uh, by saying we've talked about a lot of cool things we can do with AI to help security. And there are a lot of issues where security can affect AI. It's neither good nor bad, it's both. We need to be thinking, every time we think about AI, we need to be thinking about is, uh, what are the pros of this? What are the cons of this? It's not going to be one or the other. Um, so let me um, finish with uh, asking for a vote by the class. When you consider all of the, uh, the, the things we've talked about for the past hour and 20 minutes, um, is overall, is AI a good thing or a bad thing? So first, let me ask if you think AI for security, for security specifically, is AI a good thing for security? Can you raise your hand if you think AI is a good thing for security? Any uh, Terminator fans in here? <laughs> okay, I can see about a half dozen hands, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, all right, if you'll put your hands down. How many of you think AI is a bad thing for security? Yeah, <laughs> one, two, three, three. Okay, three. And, were, were, were any of them the same people on both? Two, I think we had two of the same. <laughs> the same. Yeah. Okay, all right. So I encourage you to think about it from both sides because as you can tell, I'm not arguing either yes or no. I think I think there's some great things and I think there's some problematic things. And that's what, when you go back 
and you think about this this discussion today, that's what I hope you're going to go away with is that it, it, there are pros, there are cons, and we need to think about them both. So I'm happy to continue having the conversation to answer any questions or, or w whatever works for you. Thank you again, Budi, for the invitation to uh, come join your class today. Thank you students for listening to me and, and uh, participating. Uh, uh, thank you, Lyle, for being MC um, and carrying them and, and Dion for carrying microphones around, things like that. We have some time for questions, but let me hand it to uh, um, um, uh... Uh, let me uh, say first, uh, thank you. Uh, great presentation, and I, I'm sure that uh, you know everybody uh, is enjoying the presentation. Uh, actually, a friend of mine said, "Can you send me the rec uh, the recording of this?" Uh, this I said, "Okay, I'd be happy to uh, send you uh, the recording of this uh, Zoom." Now, uh, the first one is not a question, but the the first one is. Uh, something that we have a problem in Indonesia especially even though we are in the uh, Institute of Technology Bandung but we have a problem in computing power in terms of GPU because AI we require more lots of GPUs my students they're having a hard time uh, accessing GPUs for their research uh, well, we've been trying to get uh, uh, solutions and investing in uh, machines and computing but uh, probably uh, if there is something that we can collaborate, and I know that uh, the in the US uh, they have a lots of computing power, that's something that we um, um, uh, we may want to uh, uh, follow up. Uh, uh, as part of that uh, question is that uh, what do you see in this region? Uh, what the other countries are doing uh, in terms of computing power for for AI? Um, uh, are they struggling or maybe Indonesia is uh, lacking or way behind compared to other countries? We know sometimes that we are afraid that we are uh, 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 way behind even compared to Vietnam, for example, in terms of the computing power. And then the uh, the second uh, the second one uh, is a question I was recently, actually yesterday was asked, should AI be regulated? I know that's not... Uh, something that we can answer in shortly, but I just want to get your opinion uh, in terms of uh, that. Okay, um, let me just make one comment about the first, and then I'm gonna uh, kick that one over to Lyle, who might have more knowledge. The the one point I wanna make before I uh, see uh, ask Lyle if he has information is um, you can't talk about GPU power uh, without also talking about the impact on climate change. Um, and, and because GPUs are all about using electricity in useful ways. Um, and uh, you can't solve that problem uh, without making climate change worse unless you're using renewable power uh, as a way to power those GPUs. So j just a thought that those two thoughts of uh, energy uh, self-sufficiency and energy greenness have to be tightly coupled to GPUs and AI. So that's kind of a, a, a whole bunch of things that come together to answer questions. Um, and I'm going to ask Lyle uh, if he knows anything about computing power in other uh, East, uh, Southeast Asian countries, because I, I have no knowledge of that. Sure. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, that was an excellent way, actually, to start the conversation. Um, so, uh, as you know, Pak, uh, you know, Southeast Asia is a sort of rapidly growing um, part of the digital economy. Um, you know, Singapore is a sort of a historical hub, but that's now migrating out to Malaysia, Indonesia, and other countries. Um, I was at a, a data center opening uh, just a couple weeks back with. Uh, the ambassador um, and uh, Minister Lahut. And uh, that's a US invested data center, which is bringing AI in the, the latest uh, computing power to Indonesia. Um, that's only the latest example. There are uh, several others that are that predate that and that are also currently being constructed by US companies. So if you think of the big ones, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, IBM, um, Google and others, they're all, uh, um, Amazon, they're all looking at um, 
bringing uh, these advanced processing and computing powers to Indonesia. Um, so, uh, but that intersects with the second question is that um, these, uh, these large um, data centers, which will house these sophisticated computing technologies, require a lot of uh, energy, um, uh, expertise, uh, proprietary technologies, and also um, um, and also uh, <laughs> and I'll, and also I uh, um, I'm sorry, I forgot that was my my backup yeah, image. I'll yeah. explain it later. Um, I think Jeremy's playing Quidditch or something, but uh, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, expertise, capital investment, um, um, and energy. Um, and so to the point Jeremy made, when we were when we we're looking at uh, we're talking to these companies about coming to Indonesia, a couple things they bring to mind are one we need uh, we need land because it's a physical location, right? We need uh, really importantly we need uh, green energy because they have a commitment to protecting the environment, protecting the future. Um, as a side note, that's especially important uh, for me in Indonesia because I think this is one of the most beautiful countries in the world and. Uh, I think seven of the top 10 diving, scuba diving sites are here in Indonesia, right? You have incredible forest and natural life that we want to see uh, remain. So that's, uh, these companies have this in their, uh, their code, if you will. So their, uh, their company um, rules, um, which are sometimes dictated by investors, require them to source with green power and to um, protect the environment. So in order for that to grow, they don't, their, their companies won't allow them to invest unless they can get that. And then the other aspect is um, the ability to provide that stable, reliable energy source. The other aspect, uh, as the professor was alluding to, is the policy. Um, is the infrastructure there? Do you have reliable cable, fiber optic cable connections? Uh, can these data flows go across Indonesia, uh, outside of Indonesia, because these servers need to interact with others around the world? Um, and does the policy enable that? Um, and of course, uh, on the other side, from the government perspective, need to make sure this is all done in a safe and secure way that protects citizen data and citizens' rights and that sort of thing. So we need to find the right balance from a policy perspective um, to enable the digital economy to flourish the data centers that really power AI to flourish, right? Because as the professor was saying, AI is not a mythical thing that lives in the cloud, right? It's actually a GPUs in rooms that are cooled with large fans that we went in the you know, rooms, with these huge fans and very sophisticated buildings, right? Uh, that require lots of energy. That's why data centers are measured in, can someone tell me? How do you measure the size of a data center? I learned this from you, Lyle. Gigawatts. You, sure, gigawatts or, or watts. You can measure it in the energy concept, but you can also measure by computing power as well. Uh, but yeah, they're typically measured in, you know, a gigawatt or, you know, 400 megawatt, um, 200 megawatt data center, depending on the scale. Right. So um, anyway, um, that's a, one way of saying that. Um, Indonesia is in a very competitive position to attract uh, the latest and greatest computing technologies. Um, uh, it has to implement regulations that support that, of course, but um, I think that is in process. We will see. Any I wanted questions? to, can I comment on that also? Um, because I think you, you covered a really crucial part of it, Lyle, but the other part of it, uh, of the question was about regulating AI not just from any uh, from an energy perspective, but uh, from a an ethical perspective, if you will, and this, this is where the the two policy papers that I shared come into play um, that I think are really useful because um, they identify areas where there might be regulation that might be appropriate, and I don't think it's my role to tell. Uh, you what the correct regulation is for Indonesia, but this is, these papers identify a number of areas um, uh, that that a group of uh, professors um, and uh, and 
pra uh, practitioners um, around the US and Europe came together and identified these as areas uh, and identify areas that, that might require regulation. So I, I think the bottom line is, it's far from clear how that regulation should work so that you get it just right, neither too much nor too little, so you get the right places. I think it would be a mistake to conclude we don't need any regulation. I think it would also be a mistake to conclude that we need everything regulated. I think where in that range AI needs to be in regulation is not clear at this point, and it's important to move fast enough, but not too fast. So regulation typically trails innovation. Um, sometimes that's a appropriate criticism, but sometimes by design, because uh, if you're too fast on the regula regulation, you can stifle innovation, and then uh, that new thing never happens. So uh, we have to sort of synchronize as much as possible. So in the U.S., the approach we've taken is to raise awareness of the need for a considerate, uh, considerated approach um, to AI development, making sure that everyone's aware there are risks involved and we should mitigate those. Um, so this is sort of a, uh, a voluntary approach to making sure that companies that have a stake in the success of this uh, innovation, this new sector, play an important role in making sure it's done safely uh, because obviously the consequences are bad for everybody, right? So if there's harm done, then new regulations will come in that may also stifle innovation. So we want to make sure it's done as uh, carefully as possible uh, without limiting the the benefit for the society. Um, and then as things go forward, there may be a point in time where we bring in regulations where we can understand the impact um, so that's the approach we're taking in, in the United States. Uh, question? Actually, can I make one other comment? Which uh, is, sure. which is, I didn't mean to to crack you up earlier when I uh, put, turn, turned my camera off and this picture came up, and so I just wanted to tell because because everyone always enjoys this picture. The story is that I was at a conference in Scotland, and instead of having us have a dinner in a hotel they brought us all to the castle where the Harry Potter movies were made. And they said, we're gonna teach you to fly a broom today. And we we got into pairs and each, uh, and one person was given a broom and, and you would put the broom between your legs and jump up and down as, uh, as much as you could while the other person took picture after picture until they got one where your feet were off the ground. So my feet, this is not a green screen picture. This is a real picture. My feet are about six inches off the ground because I'm just jumping up and down, waiting until they captured a picture with me uh, off the ground. And I've used this as my backdrop since the beginning of COVID and everybody loves the picture. I've thought about changing to other pictures, but every Everyone loves that picture. So that's my personal comment, having nothing to do with artificial intelligence or cybersecurity, but that's why that picture came up. My girlfriend brought me a, a piece of cheese to eat, and I didn't want you to have to eat, watch me eating a piece of cheese. So I turned my camera off. Yeah. Uh, my question is about uh, AI improvement. Uh, as you know, um, uh, actually, AI yeah, is uh, rapidly growing, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, more intelligent, and then more efficient, and then more improvement. So, what do you think if AI yeah, uh, change its way, and then make some problem, and then make some challenges to our existence, uh, security? Yeah? Uh, for example, uh, this is my question actually. Uh, what do you think if uh, uh, AI can uh, break uh, existing existence uh, cryptographic algorithm and then what uh, uh, will what will be the solution? And uh, you also talk about post quantum algorithm, cryptography and algorithm. Is uh, any quantum algorithm uh, developed yet or not? If yes, could you please explain it a bit uh, more? 
uh, if no, so what will be the solution? If AI can compromise and break down our existing cryptography al algorithm, uh, is there any solution on that situation or not? Thank you. Um, I think this is something that a lot of people are worried about. Um, breaks in algorithms, in cryptographic algorithms, tend to happen sort of gradually. What happens is there'll be a, um, a vulnerability identified that is in some narrow piece of the algorithm, and over time they're widened uh, against the algorithm as a whole. So for example, um, with the SHA-1 algorithm for cryptographic hashing, there was, for years, there had been um, concern that it, it could be done. And a team of researchers, I believe it was in China, uh, identified a case where they could get what's called a collision, where they could create two different documents that had the same cryptographic hash, which had been thought to be impossible. But but they only had two documents that could do it. And then it took more years before people generalize the scheme until the point where everyone recognized that it was not workable because it was just too easy to generate uh, uh, cryptographic hashes. And I expect the same thing is going to happen if there are vulnerabilities in cryptographic algorithms found using the assistance of AI is I don't expect a, a a huge break all at once. I expect there will be small breaks. There will be things that will be found. There will be small cases where if this happens and this happens and this happens, then you can do this and this and this and you can break it. And then someone else will take it, build on it and, okay. and expand and it and expand it. it. Um, so, Huh? Running out of time. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, with uh, let, let, with let me just mind, make uh, let me just make one, yeah, one more really quick, quick real quick comment, which is what's going to happen on post quantum crypto. Um, and the answer is a lot of people much smarter than me are working on it, and um, I, I know. It's an international uh, team, uh, groups of teams that are working on it. And so I'm reasonably comfortable. The timeline people are working on is 15, 20 to 30 years from now is when we need a solution. So I'm not worried about a solution tomorrow. I'm worried about having a solution 20 or 30 years from now. And people are working on that. Yeah, and then... Okay, okay, last question for everybody uh, before we uh, wrap this up. Raise your hand if you think Jeremy's photo is a deep fake or if you <laughs> believe him and that it's a real. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, thank you all for your time. I know you're very busy. Um, so we appreciate that you spent this uh, moment with us. Um, we hope this is just the beginning. We want to see you again soon. And uh, please come visit me in uh, Jakarta anytime. Um, thank you very much. and. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jadi kelas kita hari ini seperti ini. Nanti ada tugasnya seperti tadi. I have given them all the numbers. It's like what you. Numbernya adalah membaca papernya tadi yang baca itu. Tahu apa di sini pak? Okay. Nanti kita diskusinya kita buat tanggal dan nanti diskusinya buat apa? Terus yang ini sudah kelas ini akademik kami sudah tak saya perpanjang sehingga nanti bisa ke oke akan hadir terus ke lagi ya itu aja kasih ya hadir dan dari kelas lain juga hadir dan juga online terima kasih juga yang online di sini thank you very much for all of you who join us through online zoom terima kasih dan tentu saja terima kasih pak jeremy ail dan ibu bian pak bambang prastowo is actually from ugm from jogja he is joining us from jogja also, I, uh, so. I visited uh, UGM uh, okay. last year. I see. Okay. Bye. Terima kasih, Jeremy. Bye. Sehat-sehat.
Thank you so much. Oh, this is going to be in my uh, Facebook. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.